Hello everyone from San Francisco. I am Amita, co-founder of Nourish Doc, a platform for natural and holistic therapies. Our selective network of experts offer wellness programs that are backed by science, research, and outcomes. In our educational series today, we have Dr. Sujata Nayak, who is a researcher of international repute in homeopathy. She has been practicing homeopathy for over 27 years. In addition to her practice, she has written books and presented research papers at international conferences. Dr. Nayak is going to talk about how homeopathy can help treat Matildo. Well, it's truly an honor to have Dr. Sujata. Welcome, Dr. Sujata, here. Hello, Amita. It's a pleasure to be here on Nourish Talk. And thank you very much for inviting me. Absolutely. So um, if you could talk about what is vitiligo and the symptoms and causes for it for our viewers, I think it would yes. help. Right. Yes. So uh, good evening, everybody in San Francisco. Good morning, everyone in India. Uh, so uh, yeah, we are talking about this condition, vitiligo, which uh, everybody still considers as a cosmetic disfigurement, more of a cosmetic uh, issue rather than something which would affect health in general. While uh, this is more or less true, uh, everything about vitiligo is not only about the cosmetic aspect because uh, vitiligo is a condition where uh, the melanocytes, the cells which uh, are responsible for producing melanin, the pigment that gives us the skin color, those melanocytes are destroyed for some reason which uh, uh, we are not able to decipher. It's an immune system probably which is working against us and which destroys these cells. So uh, this is a condition which is uh, mostly an autoimmune disorder and uh, it causes white patches. So it is also known as leukoderma. It causes white patches all over the skin. And uh, a lot of people, especially in Asia, in India, it is still considered as a social stigma because a person with white patches uh, looks odd. And uh, especially with girls, it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's sad to say, but uh, they they don't know they no longer have the uh, the marriageable uh, value so that is one very very big issue in a country like India people tend to look at uh, patients with vitiligo in a very different manner having said that it also is a source of uh, embarrassment it's a source of uh, uh, low self uh, lack of self esteem low self esteem for a person who gets affected apart from the fact that it uh, it uh, it reduces the, uh, the the immunity of the skin itself. It reduces the protective layer of the skin because it's the interfollicular epidermis which gets affected. So the skin gets exposed to external noxious influences. So uh, people with vitiligo also suffer from a lot of sunburn and their skin tends to get infections very, very quickly. So in uh, more ways than one, we need to treat this disorder, which is not just superficial. So as they say, uh, you can define it as an acquired progressive disorder that is selectively mm -hmm. destroys some or all of the melanocytes residing in the interfollicular epidermis. Now, it, uh, the, the prevalence of vitiligo is very, very high. I mean, it's almost 1% in a lot of population. Of course, there's a lot of demographic you know, variation, mm -hmm. but more or less, uh, a lot of countries uh, in the world would be suffering from 0.5 to 1% of the population having this condition and the symptoms of course are just white patches on the skin so to the onlooker to a person who looks at a person with vitiligo all you will see are white patches which initially would start as a uh, as very um, uh, very non-descript uh, hypopigmented patches and they, they they could rapidly or depending on how the progression is uh, slowly or gradually also increase to very well defined demarcated white patches Sometimes the onset is very rapid and uh, extremely uh, um, devastating because uh, you just see a white patch and within a few months, yeah. a large part of the skin is covered. And some people you may have a white patch to begin with and it remains dormant for several years and may not manifest until some time when the immunity really goes low. So the effects are mostly, as I said, emotional and psychological, not really painful or debilitating mm -hmm. or affecting the health in general. Yeah, but I, I, I can imagine. Yeah, I can imagine being emotional because of someone like you said, uh, especially a woman has white patches on her skin. Then it's a social becomes a, you know socially aloof, right? Yeah. You can become yes. very socially. Aloof. So, um, 
Yeah, so maybe uh, you could tell us a little about different types of vitiligo. Yes, uh, uh, though the treatment uh, doesn't really differ, especially with, uh, we're talking about homeopathy and I'm a homeopath. But uh, yeah. for practical purposes, you would differentiate vitiligo into uh, two very broad aspects. And one is known as the segmental vitiligo where uh, you have isolated patches, you know, on uh, the skin. And uh, it may just kind of just come very rapidly and then stop. So there is no uh, pattern to it. Uh, but you have the non-segmental vitiligo, which is more common and that is generalized vitiligo, which is generally bilateral, so it's symmetrical. And uh, mm -hmm. you can have patches starting at the same time, mostly at the mucocutaneous junctions, like the junction of the eyes or uh, the lips or the nails. You know, these are the areas where you generally, uh, one would experience the depigmentation starting. And then you have the acrophation and the universal vitiligo, which are not very common, but are definitely more devastating. Because in universal vitiligo, almost 80% of the skin and the mucous membrane would become white. So uh, that is a that is a different uh, aspect, but more or less, it's a generalized vitiligo which we treat. And uh, the cause is very, very still uncertain because for no reason, we uh, sometimes find uh, a person will just come and say, we don't know why it happened. Of course, we'll come mm -hmm. to the homeopathic aspect and how homeopaths uh, view vitiligo. It's very different yeah. thing. We'll come to that later. But the most uh, common factors that are a complex of vitiligo susceptibility genes. So there is a strong genetic component which uh, is there. So it, you can have a gene for vitiligo and not suffer from vitiligo throughout your life until there are triggers. So genetically mm -hmm. abnormal men and melanocytes are there. And an environmental or physiological factor that activates the genetic program. As I said that uh, you may carry the gene and you may not if the atmosphere around it is conducive uh, you have a good nutritional uh, status you don't suffer from any uh, uh, secondary infections which might uh, reduce your immunity to uh, allow the vitiligo to surface so that can happen but there you need a genetic component and an environment or a situational trigger that's how it I is see. So these are the okay. types so yes Sure, sure. So I, I think uh, most of our viewers want to know how homeopathy can help vitiligo. Yes. How does it work? Yeah. So yeah. Uh, this uh, this is very interesting because uh, uh, while allopaths would treat vitiligo as uh, with, through a standardized protocol, like you have suralin and you have the UV treatments, homeopathy yeah. views vitiligo in a very different way. We believe that anything that is an expression on the outward surface, like on the skin especially, is an indication that the system, the constitution is crying for help. It is trying to externalize a problem which is within. And if you try and suppress it at the surface, then it is going to go and affect your vital organs in some way or the other. So there's a strong correlation we see sometimes between skin disorders and uh, conditions like bronchial asthma, allergic uh, or, or re respiratory disorders, or maybe GI conditions or arthritis. So when you suppress, the, the body is trying to show that you have a skin problem, then probably there's something that needs to be corrected internally. So homeopathy actually is, uh, is a very holistic uh, method of treatment, a natural healing system. So it mm -hmm. does not treat the disease, but the man in disease. Uh, having said that, the approach is very individualistic. So a treatment that is a medicine that is given to one person for one condition may not be the same medication that is given to another person with a similar condition. It could vary depend, depending on individual responses. So it is a therapeutic system of medicine based on two very fundamental principles. And the main principle mm -hmm. is law of similars. What is it? What mm -hmm. is the law of similars? It's that what produces, eliminates. What causes, heals. So a symptom that substance can produce in healthy individual are the same symptoms that it can cure in a diseased person. So uh, mm -hmm. this was founded by Dr. Samuel Hahnemann, the founder of homeopathy. He himself was an uh, allopathic practitioner. And mm -hmm. he realized that he, uh, when there was a malaria epidemic, he realized that quinine, if given in uh, potentized, highly ultra-diluted doses, can actually mm -hmm. treat symptoms of malaria and can eliminate the, the malaria without causing any kind of serious side effects. So this is the law of similar. So it is nothing that is morbid cannot be expressed to signs and symptoms. This is what a homeopath believes. That whenever there is something morbidly wrong with the body, it is going to come out through symptoms and signs. And therefore, homeopathy is basically a science of symptoms. Where we, uh, so the homeopath is trained to observe and to record every little aberration in terms of symptoms that a patient may be expressing, which may not be discernible to 
a person from another system. The second most important fundamental uh, uh, law of homeopathy is the law of the minimum dose. Homeopathy works through ultra, ultra dilutions, through potentized medicines which contain very little of the material substance. So what we believe is, is you just require a very small push to your immune system for it to start healing itself. And homeopathic remedies do exactly that. So the law of the minimum dose states the quantity of action necessary to effect any change in nature is the least possible. The decisive amount is always a minimum and infinite similar. So uh, if you look at it, paradoxically, we are even in modern medicine, we are actually, the wheel is turning a full circle. Even in cancer mm -hmm. therapy today, where we were talking about the maximum permissible toxic dose, today we are coming down to the minimum therapeutic dose. So homeopathy is uh, the science of customization, individualization, and the law of the minimum dose. So homeopathic dose is the minimum therapeutic dose needed to start off the process of cure, cure after which the body's innate defense mechanism takes over, which is also broadly, not really uh, subtly, but broadly the system of vaccinations. What do you do in a vaccine? In a vaccination, you would uh, inject or you would uh, administer the noxious uh, microorganism in very, very small quantities to trigger off uh, immune response. So similarly with uh, homeopathy, you would give the substance that causes the symptoms in very, very infinite simile doses to trigger the body to, uh, the, you know, to bring out its immune response. So how does it work? So there are different protocols that we follow in um, vitiligo. Now, vitiligo being an autoimmune condition, and as I said, we work through the theory of individualization the constitutional approach is the mainstay of homeopathic prescription always. And uh, this is where we consider the entire constitution of the human being to make a prescription. So including his, uh, the patient's chief complaints, the mm -hmm. associated complaints, all the concomitants and modalities that go with the chief complaint, the patient's uh, life situation, his mental status, and of course his uh, background, that is his medical history, his family history, uh, the conditions, the environment that he lives in. So all that is compiled into a lot of data. And so very scientific method, all this is analyzed and then evaluated and converted into the repertorial language, the medical, uh, the materia medica and the repertory of homeopathic um, treatment. And those symptoms are matched with the symptoms that have been already recorded in clinical provings on healthy individuals. So it is a question of permutations and combinations of matching symptoms that are expressed by the patient with the symptoms that have already been recorded in a healthy individual. So these are, this is how a homeopath would treat. So this is the classical method of homeopathy. There, a prescription is individualized and customized for the patient. So I cannot say that this is the medicine for vitiligo. What I use mm -hmm. for vitiligo in one patient could be used for a migraine in another patient. So you got it? So the remedy is highly individualized. So this is the concept. That's very interesting. That's yeah. very interesting. It's very different than a modern medication that you know you exactly. take a Tylenol for your headache or something like yes. that. It's a completely so different for example, concept. And, I'll try and make it yeah. simpler for you. For example, if you said that I have a headache and give me something and yeah. have a headache. And that yeah. wouldn't really mean anything to me. But if you said that I have a headache which is right sided, I have a headache which yes. uh, uh, gets worse when I am doing something, I'd rather rest in a dark room then that makes mm -hmm. it simpler because then through permutation and combination for headache we have more than 2000 3000 remedies but right sided oh. headache will have 500 remedies a right sided headache which is better with rest will have probably only 10 remedies so this mm -hmm. is how you come down through the series of individualistic approach to one remedy which suits the patient at that time for his condition so this is the classical way of approach having said mm -hmm. that uh, sometimes the, the situation is not very conducive for a very detailed case taking for several reasons the patient may not be educated or uh, you have mm -hmm. patients on a mass scale suffering from similar kind of symptoms or if there are yeah. environmental factors which are strong enough to trigger that uh, response for example we uh, go to a rural hospital in Maharashtra every month mm -hmm. where we conduct regular camps you know, mm -hmm. I go with my team and uh, we yeah. found that a lot of patients there uh, suffer from leukodermic patches you know so mm -hmm. like white patches on the skin and that is yeah. because they are uh, we found that a lot of people are working in furnaces there in companies which have furnaces and mm -hmm. because of the high intensity of the heat that they're exposed to the skin uh, 
initially it turns black and then the superficial layer of the skin uh, would uh, start, you know, you, you can have hyperpigmentation, you can have hypo also. So they have uh, where the melanocyte starts getting destroyed and they have these white patches. So when you have a lot of people coming with this kind of condition with no other data to work on, then we use something mm -hmm. known as a keynote method where we take all the common symptoms that the patient is presenting with all the patients, mm -hmm. make a common repertorial totality and we use one single characteristic symptom that every patient might have different from the other and use it mm -hmm. to differentiate the homeopathic remedy from the others and make an individual prescription. This is also a perfectly homeopathic way of approaching. This is known as a keynote method and we are using mm -hmm. it on a large scale in, uh, in community settings where you have a lot of people coming mm -hmm. with similar issues. So we use this method even in fungal infections in uh, uh, pityriasis and tinea where you see that a lot of patients come with absolutely similar conditions. So this is one thing, uh, we can also use it in epidemics. Uh, the third mm -hmm. one is specific remedies as an adjuvant. So uh, we have some remedies in homeopathy which have a special affinity for the skin and the mucous membranes. And those mm -hmm. remedies need to be used when the pathology is so advanced that you're not going to get any characteristic constitutional symptoms of the patient but just symptoms of the disease that he's suffering from. For example, he just says, I have white patches and I've tried every possible treatment. He's been on high doses of steroids and the vitiligo is so widespread that it is now not coming under control at all. So here you just try and arrest the phenomenon, the arrest the pathology in any which way you can. So you use these specific remedies until the immunity raises to a level where the patient can start exhibiting constitutional symptoms. So the crux of the matter is that the closer you are to subjective and mental symptoms, we use a higher potency of the remedy and we don't repeat it that often. We probably might just give one uh, dose and wait until the next reaction appears. So this is how uh, is the broad line classification. It's a huge subject, but I realize that we have a motley crowd today from all kinds of uh, um, backgrounds. So this is just to make it very simple for everybody. So can we go to the next slide? Yes. Sure, sure. Please tell us. Uh, I think it would really help if you can share a success case. Um, yes. You know, that treated and I think it will resonate more with the users, you know, what happened. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, uh, homeopathy is uh, one of the systems that believe very strongly in the mind-body connection. And uh, mm -hmm. we believe that uh, anything that is expressed externally on the body will first have its origin somewhere at a very dynamic mental level. So it could be any mm -hmm. kind of a trauma, an experience, it could be um, an accident or it could be an infection that the patient has suffered and uh, the, the experience that he goes through, the way it changes him as a person physically and mentally, mm -hmm. all that is noted and that is given a lot of importance. For example, you uh, a person who comes with a splitting headache, for example, uh, you said we were talking about headache a few minutes ago and yep. then we will typically ask that uh, how were you before uh, your headache manifested? Was there something that affected you? Uh, and you may say, oh, I had a tiff with my boss or my boss said something that uh, didn't make me feel, feel good. I felt very humiliated because he shouted at me in front of so many people. So that would be a very, very important uh, causative factor. And that would actually help us to delineate the remedy much better. So this is how, so we, we give a lot of importance to these background factors, especially the mental symptoms of the patient and the mental mm -hmm. state in which the patient presents with his physical problem. So this is how I'm going to just uh, relate one of the cases. We have several hundred cases, but uh, the time that is permitted to us, I'm going to explain this and I hope that uh, will help you to understand the homeopathic approach mm -hmm. much better. So this is a case of vitiligo where we had, uh, this is very unusual because vitiligo is more common in the 20 to 40 age group. But I wanted okay. to present this case because it's a pediatric case and uh, vitiligo is not so very common in children. But it of course is becoming more common now because children are suffering more from autoimmune disorders than ever before. So you have more bronchial asthma and skin conditions and atopic allergies and uh, hay fever and these kind of conditions in children now because we have now reduced the preventable causes of illness. So the only way that the body is going to now express itself is through autoimmune disorders because we're suppressing the superficial expressions of illness. So this is a four and a half, this is a very interesting case by the way because this, the whole aspect of the homeopathic approach can be uh, demarcated in this. So four and a half year old girl came to us 
with hypopigmented. Hypopigmented is less pigment. You can see that the pigment is reduced and it's a white patch, a whitish patch around the left eye. And a simultaneously small patch on the left foot. So this was when she presented to us. It, it was a very rapid uh, onset. You can see it was just two weeks before she presented to us that uh, this was noticed by her grandfather. She was living in a joint family with her grandparents. And symptoms, the patient had no symptoms whatsoever regarding those white patches. There was no itching, there was no pain, there was no inflammation, no burning, nothing. So the girl was oblivious to this. It was her grandparents who noticed this. So they had consulted a dermatologist because uh, when they saw it, they said the first um, reaction is to show uh, the doctor who would deal with this. So they consulted a dermatologist and he advised Momet cream. Momet is a steroid cream to apply at night and one's a strong lotion. So these are the general treatments that allopaths would apply, uh, would uh, initially uh, use because they, they always believe that an autoimmune response needs to be suppressed with uh, immunosuppressive remedies and that is steroids. So she also had, so when we took the history, we found that she also had history of cold, cough and fever on and off since early childhood. She had to take antibiotics and inhale steroids quite often. So this was something which was a lot of significance to us. So she was, <clears throat> so what was actually causing the illness in her was the cough and cold, the repeated attacks of cold, cough, cold and breathlessness. So this was something that was affecting her a lot. And, uh, and the, it, she was an inhaled steroids, nebulizers and steroids and uh, um, the inhalers. Mm -hmm. So she, uh, the other history that she was also constipated, she had been dewormed, she used to complain of abdominal pain off and on. She is, she has a good appetite but a very capricious kind of child. So she doesn't like the regular stuff, she likes restaurant food and she likes junk, sweets, chocolates, mm -hmm. cold food, milkshakes, cold coffee, ice cream, so mostly all these kinds of stuff. And uh, she's just very restless during sleep. So can we go to the next slide? Yeah. yeah, so she's a hot patient. Hot as in we talk about the thermal modality. So this is again a very important uh, modality for uh, homeopathic doctors often helping us to differentiate one remedy from another. So by hot, how do we uh, um, understand that? Is that the patient wants the air conditioner, she wants the fan all the time. She doesn't like clothes on her. She would like to remove her clothes when she goes to bed at night. And uh, mm -hmm. she just cannot bear the heat in any form. She gets very irritable over small things. Very obstinate, headstrong, probably she's pampered at home. And she, there's something unusual is that for a child of four and a half, she is prone to a lot of anger. There's a lot of violence mm -hmm. incipient in her and she'll strike back when somebody tries to uh, contradict her in any way. Uh, she, although she's very fun loving and she loves to play, she wants to go out all the time. She's moody and she likes to watch TV. Mm -hmm. This is of course, uh, a very situational issue. Next one. Yes. So what have we done? We have taken all the symptoms one by one, the way the patient presents. Now, <clears throat> what the patient is expressing <clears throat> is very important to us rather than what the pathology is saying. We don't depend on the diagnosis for our medicine. So diagnosis just kept aside to know which direction we are heading. So she's a very irritable child. She's prone to anger. You can see that she has changeable moods. She's prone to cough and cold. So all these things are taken as symptoms and then converted into repertory language. And you can see a list of remedies that is coming up. This is how a typical repertorization sheet in homeopathy would look like. So you can see that the first remedy that is coming up is lycopodium. Lycopodium is one of the chief remedies also for vitiligo because it has strong affinity for the skin and mucous membrane. And here it is matching the patient's mental state. It's matching the patient's constitution in every way. So let's go to the next one and I'll say and tell you how we prescribe this. So we was we gave the patient lycopodium in a 30 C potency twice a day for four days. Homeopathy believes in the minimum dose, so we just give it for four days, followed by saccharum lactum, which is a placebo, for one month. And the patient was monitored throughout this time. And then of course there were certain dietary uh, factors that also were advised. So we gave her she wasn't eating enough of greens, so we told her to do that. After two weeks, the patient's mother called up saying that now she's severe cold and cough since three days, which is aggravated while sleeping. So if you realize the homeopathic remedy is now trying to cure the patient internally. So mm -hmm. uh, she, but the patient was comfortable. She did not complain of discomfort, nor had fever or wheezing. So which is very common when she has this infection. So it was obvious that it was not infective. And because she was comfortable, we did not interfere with the treatment. On the second follow-up, the patient's cough and cold had settled in two days. We said that she was without inhalers is the first time 
the cough and cold settle on its own. But the hyperpigmented patch remains the same. So the grandparents are very concerned about that. Is that you haven't given anything for that, please give us something for that. But we know that we are proceeding in the right direction because it's the internal malady that needs to be cured first. So now we give the lycopodium dose in a higher potency of 1000 ml. Uh, and then we again follow it with circuit. Now we just give one dose because we are giving a higher potency. Now on the third follow up, you see that there's marked difference in the hypopigmented patch near the left eye. The patch on the left foot remains the same. No new vitiligo patches have been noticed. Patient was kept on placebo. Next one. Uh, see the difference now. now. See? Yes. yes. So the hypopigmented patch near the left eye completely disappeared on the fourth follow up. And the patch on the left foot had started to get normal skin color. Now she's okay. less irritable. She doesn't get violent with her family members. She cooperates with her friends while playing, which she earlier didn't. Now these are very subtle changes, but the, they will come out voluntarily from the relatives, from the people, from the guardians. And then now she's okay. just kept on the monitoring. Uh, her patch on the left foot is now completely disappeared. On the fifth follow-up, patient is kept on placebo. All her cough cold symptoms have come down. She does not need inhalers. This is a one-year follow-up, so we can now safely say that a patient has responded very well to the treatment. After one year also, there is no recurrence of any vitiligo patches, while the general health of the child continues to remain good without any medication. So this has been a, a very, very uh, satisfactorily handled case, uh, though we you know, may not be very lucky every time if it is very advanced. But in children, in young adults, the prognosis is very good because if we can... Uh, kind of zero down on the cause effect. We know the background and here that even if there's a genetic component, if the immunity is good, the vitiligo can be treated completely and very, very safely without any side effects. So this is how it is. Yeah, this is excellent. Excellent. So um, I, I want to open it up for questions. Um, I see one question coming up. Uh, one of the questions I wanted to ask was, you said it took one year, so, but Approximately, what time, how much time do you think on an average of a typical patient, someone who comes with the white patches, how much time would, would, would it take in your mind? Yes, uh, now we have been monitoring the patients. You know, uh, in uh, uh, vitiligo, uh, it is a very uh, difficult in some ways uh, to monitor the patient because what happens sometimes is that the mm -hmm. hypopigmentation and the repigmentation is happening simultaneously. So, uh, what the rate, the rate of uh, Repigmentation, if it is higher, then the vitiligo goes down more rapidly. So we have to monitor both the things and it being an autoimmune condition, there can be periods of natural remission as well. So uh, mm -hmm. sometimes uh, the patient is uh, very well for a couple of months or three months and another attack of cold or cough or asthma and that is suppressed with uh, inhaled steroids or with oral steroids and then you see the vitiligo coming back with a vengeance. So it is, uh, uh, I would say it is for a case but in children and young adults, as I said, that uh, the response is more rapid. We can expect good response within six months. Now, do we monitor the patient for sufficiently long, perhaps a year or two years also? But uh, I would say on an average, uh, six months. So now during that six months, there's another question uh, people want to know is that, is there a special diet that you would also tell them or some triggers that might, uh, you know, uh, get their skin again or do you, do you also give them some kind of dietary restrictions as yeah. well? Uh, homeopathy doesn't really have too much of dietary restriction except because uh, homeopathic medicines are ultra dilutions and they are the okay. absolute, uh, very, very minute doses. So they can be suppressed with very, very strong external agents. So we always advise mm -hmm. the patients to keep off very strong stimulants or uh, very strong tasting pungent uh, things when they are on the medicine or at least keep a sufficiently long gap because our medicines are absorbed through the sublingual route. That is, you put the pills directly on the tongue, the globules, and they're absorbed yeah. through the sublingual read, uh, route directly into your uh, system. So, any, so if you've had something which is very strong, like a very strong black puffy, or um, you've had something like uh, mint, which can suppress mm -hmm. the, the tongue, you know, the receptors on the tongue, then that would uh, delay the absorption of the medicine. It may not allow the medicine to get absorbed. So these are the only restrictions for homeopathy. But generally for vitiligo, we would say that obviously there is some kind of deficiency. We've seen that zinc deficiency or magnesium or sometimes in anemic patients also uh, vitiligo can get triggered uh, more rapidly. But of course, uh, it's, a, it's an autoimmune condition with a very strong genetic component. So diet doesn't have a very major role to play. People have a lot of misconceptions about 
avoiding dairy if you have vitiligo or avoiding uh, meat or avoiding certain kind of vegetables or so i i wouldn't really say that there's any proven correlation between uh, diet and vitiligo right nice. uh, another question that uh, someone is asking is that uh, did michael jackson also had uh, did he have vitiligo I mean, can you comment uh, on on Pardon, that i didn't i didn't get you uh, what michael jackson did uh, you know he had some white patches. Oh yeah. They uh, say that he. <laughs> I wouldn't really uh, have any uh, first-hand information on that. It's more like what he and yeah. Uh, but obviously, uh, uh, maybe he wanted to change his skin color to something which was more uh, in tune okay. with everybody else. So he actually uh, did something, used some kind of corrosive. Uh, injections to uh, reduce the pigmentation. Oh, okay. To he did the reverse in fact. He did I the see. reverse. So yeah, so he wanted. He probably, uh, you know, uh, uh, what would you say? Induced universal vitiligo to become completely <laughs> white. So uh, well, how safe that was, we really don't know. But and we wouldn't want any of our viewers to try those methods. Uh, yes, uh, but though I have, uh, we have seen patients who. Uh, have patches of white skin and then when it becomes like completely uh, you know uh, all over the body then they are more comfortable because it looks more uniform however vitiligo does predispose you to uh, a lot of other issues like sunburn is the main thing because the superficial layer of the skin is now exposed so uh, definitely vitiligo needs to be treated for more for health reasons and less for cosmetic reasons